Competition weapon of the bourgeoisie. Competition among workers is the bourgeoisie's most effective tool against the proletariat. The proletariat's helplessness. Without work, the proletarian cannot survive and is at the mercy of the bourgeoisie. The illusion of choice. Workers have the illusion of free choice but are forced to accept the bourgeoisie's terms to survive. The limit of competition. The minimum wage is determined by the worker's need for subsistence, which is relative and varies between individuals and cultures. The bourgeoisie's advantage. The abundance of workers allows the bourgeoisie to exploit their labor and maintain its power. Survival at any cost. Workers will endure poor working conditions and low wages to avoid starvation and homelessness. Impact on wages. Minimum wage. The minimum wage is determined by the worker's subsistence needs and is relative to individual circumstances. Family labor. The employment of women and children has enabled the bourgeoisie to further reduce wages. Average wages. The average wage is based on a fully employed family, putting families with fewer working members at a disadvantage. The bourgeoisie's power. Control of resources. The bourgeoisie has a monopoly over all means of existence and can dictate the terms of employment. Profit-driven employment. The bourgeoisie only employs workers if it can profit from their labor leaving surplus workers to starve. Competition among the bourgeoisie. The maximum wage is determined by the competition among the capitalists who need workers to increase their capital. The bourgeoisie's need for workers. The bourgeoisie needs workers to produce and sell goods for profit, leading to higher wages when the demand for goods increases. Average wage. The average wage is slightly above the minimum when neither workers nor capitalists have a reason to compete intensely among themselves. It is influenced by the average needs and the level of civilization of the workers. Variations in average wage. Different occupations require different levels of skill and regularity, leading to variations in the average wage between industries and types of work. Workers as commodities. Slavery in disguise. Workers are essentially slaves of the property holding class, their value fluctuating based on the demand for their labor. Disposable workforce. When the demand for workers falls, they are left unemployed and face starvation. Malthus's theory of population. Malthus's theory, stating that population growth is regulated by the availability of resources, applies to the worker's situation. The illusion of freedom. Workers today appear free because they are not sold once but continuously sell their labor. However, they are still slaves to the property holding class. Advantages for the bourgeoisie. This arrangement benefits the bourgeoisie as they can dismiss workers without losing invested capital and obtain cheaper labor than under the slave system. Adam Smith's assertion, demand and supply of labor. Adam Smith's assertion that the demand for men regulates their production is accurate in the context of the workers' commodification. The demand for workers influences their production, availability, and survival. Surplus population. The Malthusian principle, Malthus's theory, while flawed in some aspects, correctly identifies the existence of a surplus population due to intense competition among workers, increased productivity and job loss, technological advancements, and the relentless drive for productivity lead to job displacement and create a surplus of labor, economic cycles, and unemployment. The cyclical nature of the economy, with its booms and busts, exacerbates the problem of surplus population as seen in England's periodic crises. The reserve army of labor, the unemployed surplus population, serves as a reserve army of labor, available for exploitation during periods of high demand and discarded during downturns. The plight of the surplus population, desperation and survival. The surplus population resorts to begging, stealing, and various menial jobs to survive, often barely making ends meet. Competition for meager opportunities. They compete fiercely for any available work, even resorting to dangerous occupations like collecting horse dung on busy roads. Huckstering and peddling. Many turn to huckstering and peddling, selling small items on the streets to earn a meager income. Daily struggle for work. They gather at the docks before dawn, hoping to be chosen for a day's work, often facing disappointment and returning home empty-handed. The role of industrial competition unregulated production and crises. The unregulated nature of production and distribution, driven by profit rather than need, 
leads to recurring economic crises, market fluctuations and speculation. Blind speculation and market fluctuations cause overproduction, leading to crashes and widespread unemployment. The vicious cycle. The crisis deepens as businesses fail, unemployment rises, and poverty spreads, further reducing demand and prolonging the economic downturn. Gradual recovery and renewed exploitation. The economy eventually recovers as accumulated goods are consumed, but the surplus population remains vulnerable and ready to be exploited once again when demand rises. Beggars and criminals. Beggars are predominantly workers. The surplus population turns to begging, often targeting working-class districts for support due to shared experiences and empathy. Tactics of beggars. Some beggars employ pleading songs or speeches, while others rely on silent appeals to evoke sympathy from fellow workers. Criminal response to surplus. Some individuals, driven by desperation and anger, turn to crime as a form of rebellion against their dire circumstances. Extent of the surplus population. Official estimates. Reports estimate 1.5 million surplus individuals in England and Wales, excluding those who don't seek relief and those in agricultural areas. Worsening crisis. The crisis of 1842 exemplifies the severity of the situation, with skyrocketing poor rates, vacant houses, and a massive increase in the number of people needing support. Reports of manufacturers. Reports from manufacturers in 1845 reveal widespread suffering, reduced consumption, and declining wages across various industries. Social unrest and suffering. Starvation and desperation. The unemployed resort to begging in large numbers, often with an air of desperation and threat due to their overwhelming numbers. Riots and uprisings. In some areas, the dire conditions lead to disturbances and riots, as seen in the Staffordshire Potteries and the General Insurrection of 1842. Manchester's Plight. Even months after the peak of the crisis, Manchester still grappled with crowds of unemployed workers and idle mills. Inadequate relief efforts. Poor rates and charitable donations are insufficient to address the widespread suffering, and many rely on credit from small dealers to survive. Hidden casualties. While most survive the crisis, many succumb to indirect consequences like disease and malnutrition.